Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to another virtual investor event hosted by NZX. My name is Doug Vrame, and I'm with the Capital Markets Origination Team at the Exchange. Uh, we want to thank everyone, everyone for joining us. We have three presentations for you today. And just a quick reminder uh, of the format. Each company will have 15 minutes, uh, then we'll be followed by five minutes of Q&A. If you want to ask questions, we encourage you to do so. Just enter them in your, in your chat function up on the webinar panel. Uh, and we'll get through as many as we can in that five minutes. Whatever we don't get to, uh, we'll send out to the to the group uh, at, at, with follow-up questions, and we'll send a link to the replay of the webinar as well. So just a real quick um, overview. The three companies we have today are Chorus, which is a listed company on NZX, and we have Comvita, which is also listed on NZX, and then we've got a company called Black Pearl Group, which is not currently listed on NZX, but they've stated their uh, intention to list on the exchange before the end of the year. So let's get things started with J.B. Russolo from Chorus, who hopefully you can see on the screen up there. Um, J.B. is the CEO of Chorus and has held senior positions at Telstra and NBN Co, which operates Australia's national broadband network. Most recently, he was chief strategy officer at NBN, and before that, he oversaw NBN's network and service operations. Uh, he holds an MBA from the MIT Sloan School of Management in the US, and a master's of in, excuse me a master's degree in engineering so jb thank you for kicking things off today and i will turn it over to you uh, thank you kia ora everybody uh, greetings and welcome to this uh, nzx virtual uh, investor briefing um i'm jb russelo the ceo of chorus um chorus is basically new zealand's largest communication infrastructure business uh, we've been listed on the nzx uh, since late 2011 uh, and that was after the structural separation of uh, Telecom New Zealand. Uh, we're a network business, uh, so we own and we operate uh, high-tech network electronics, uh, also thousands of kilometers of fiber and of copper, uh, underground ducts, poles, cabinets, uh, and then exchange buildings uh, all around New Zealand. Um, our copper and our fiber cables uh, connect about 1.3 million customers, uh, and they also connect to things like mobile phone towers, traffic lights, uh, CCTV cameras uh, and data center. Uh, we are a wholesale only business. Uh, so this means that we can't sell uh, direct to customers. Uh, so we have about 100 retailers uh, that use our network uh, to deliver uh, phone and broadband and telecommunication services. Our company purpose uh, is connecting Aotearoa so that we can all live, learn, work and play. Uh, and to achieve this uh, means continuing to grow the uptake on our networks uh, so that their socioeconomic benefits can help uh, power the, the digital future of New Zealand. Uh, we've got three pillars to our strategy. Uh, the first one and our most important one uh, is to win in our coal fiber business. Uh, the focus remains on really increasing uh, the take up on our network, on delivering great customer experience, uh, and also on leveraging our new regulatory framework uh, to benefit all the stakeholders. The second one, optimizing our non-fiber asset, is about withdrawing our, our copper network uh, in areas where we do have fiber. And it's also about streamlining our property assets, but also looking at options uh, for future uh, broadband coverage in rural New Zealand. And then growing new revenues uh, is about products uh, both in and outside our regulatory framework. I'm gonna go into a little bit more details for, for some of those. Uh, winning in our coal fibers business, I said, is, is our primary and most important one. Uh, and it's because for the last decade, uh, we've been busy building a fiber optic cable network uh, that, as I said, covered about 1.3 million homes and businesses. Uh, that rollout was a public-private partnership, so a PPP with the government, uh, called the Ultra Fast Broadband or UFB initiative. Uh, there were three other local fiber companies that were part of the initiatives. And together, we now cover about 87% of the population of New Zealand. And, and Chorus accounts for about 75% of that coverage. So not only are urban areas covered with fiber, but small remote communities like Hast or Fox Glacier on the South Island also have fiber now. Now, the demand for fiber has also far exceeded the initial expectations. Uh, it started with the arrival of Netflix in 2015, which really kicked up demand for fiber. Uh, and then the long-term changes uh, in working habits uh, that were brought on by COVID further accelerated this trend as working from home 
uh, made access to fast, reliable broadband uh, not just something that was a nice to have, uh, but really an essential utility. So with the rollout now pretty much done, uh, we have already reached about 71% uptake uh, so far. Uh, and this grows at about 1% uh, per quarter. Uptake in our biggest market, which is Auckland, is already at 80%. And we're also seeing some really strong growth in Wellington, uh, where we're winning customers, not just from copper to fiber, but also uh, from the competing uh, Vodafone HFC cable network. Now, the widespread availability of fiber uh, and the strong uptake uh, means that New Zealand is now seen as one of the global broadband leaders. Uh, in fact, we ranked 10th uh, in a recent uh, OMDI research index. Uh, on which Singapore and South Korea were the leaders. So uh, it's a really good position to be in, uh, but the rest of the world is starting to catch up fast because there is really a boom in fiber rollouts around the world. Uh, even traditional HFC network operators are switching to fiber if they can. And some of the countries uh, in Europe in particular have set coverage targets for fiber that are well uh, into the 90% range. And that's because uh, the, the last 10 years tell us that demand for bandwidth uh, is only going to continue to grow. Uh, you've got future services like 8K TV, like augmented and, and virtual reality that are going to continue to require more speed uh, and lower latency. And, and fiber is now widely acknowledged as the most future-proof technology uh, in terms of reliability, in terms of speed, uh, and in terms of overall capacity. If you look at the, the last financial year, uh, the data traffic on our network grew by 23%. Uh, that's the equivalent of 1.3 billion gigabytes. Uh, it's a lot of data. Uh, and as you can see from the chart on the left, uh, most of that demand uh, is at the peak time uh, in the evening around 9 p.m. Uh, and that peak keeps growing on more and more uh, year on year as people use uh, especially online streaming services. The only the other uh, big contributor are gaming and we see extreme peaks uh, on nights when you have services like Fortnite that release uh, a game update. And then on the chart on the right, uh, you can see the impact of COVID uh, and the fact that the COVID lockdowns did drive significant increases uh, in usage uh, and in particular upload traffic. So not the traffic that comes down to your computer, but the thing that comes up from your computer. Uh, this has grown because working from home and services like video conferencing have really become a commonplace uh, in New Zealand. So overall, the average monthly data usage for fiber users has grown from 500 gigabytes per month to 567 uh, gigabytes per month just during the last financial year. Uh, and we forecast that that average usage uh, will reach 1,000 gigabytes per month uh, by 2025. Uh, and in fact, we already have about 15% of our customers that are already uh, at that level of monthly data consumption. Now, uh, hopefully most of you are already on fiber. Uh, if you're not, uh, then there is a whole range of plans that are available from uh, retailers. Uh, we start with our starter level plan, which is a 50 megabits per second service. Uh, then close to 70% of our mass market connections are on the 300 megabit service uh, that we introduced uh, almost a year ago. And that was boosting what was a 100 megabit plan to 300 at no additional cost. Uh, then we have almost a quarter of the connections that are on one gigabits plan. And we also now have about a thousand connections that are on what we call hyperfiber plans. And those deliver two, four, or eight gigabit speeds. Uh, and we expect these hyperfiber services to become increasingly popular over time. Uh, just like the one gigabit plan uh, started off with small numbers of customers um, about four or five years ago. And then just a few months ago, uh, we trialed 25 gigabit technology. Uh, which can be delivered on our existing fiber just alongside our existing services by connecting your electronic equipment on either side of the fiber. So the bulk of the investment in the fiber can be leveraged to deliver those additional speeds. And this again shows uh, how fiber is the most cost-effective and scalable technology. Uh, the need for higher speed and reliability is not limited to urban areas. Uh, if you look at the chart on the right, uh, you can see how the rollout of fiber, which is marked by that little dotted line, really triggers a big boost in terms of fixed broadband connections in smaller communities also. Uh, before that, you can see that the connections are declining and it's likely reflecting that consumers are uh, trying other technologies like wireless. But when uh, fiber becomes available, you can see a rapid lift uh, in our network connections. 
Now, an increasingly important characteristic of fiber is its sustainability credentials. Uh, the charts on the slides uh, show how fiber has enabled us to accommodate huge increases uh, in data demand without much change in electricity consumption. And fiber is really the only technology that can cope with higher speeds without increasing emissions. So we're targeting about a 25% reduction in electricity usage by 2030 uh, as we move customers to fiber and then we can switch off our copper network uh, in those areas. In fact, we've already removed customers from about 200 cabinets so far and turned them off. And that fiber capability and our copper withdrawal program together underpins our commitment to a 62% reduction uh, in our scope one and scope two carbon emissions by 2030 uh, when you compare it to uh, 2020. Now, as I said, one of our pillars is focusing on growing new revenues, both regulated and unregulated ones. On the regulated side, uh, to give you a few examples, we've reduced our hyperfiber pricing to help drive uptake uh, of that. And we hope to see more retailers offer hyperfiber uh, as the service evolves. Uh, this is really something that helps us uh, drive the average revenue per users. Uh, and then on the business side, business fiber connections grew by about 12% uh, in 2022. And we estimate that about three quarters of the business market, uh, excluding uh, small and home businesses, uh, have moved to fiber. So there's still uh, some growth there. Now on the unregulated side, a couple of examples, we're exploring uh, using our exchange building as secure spaces for computing capacity. So small data centers, uh, we call that edge centers. Uh, we've built four of these so far and one uh, is already at capacity. So we think that there is a growing demand for that type of service. Another example is leveraging the data of our network. So we've launched a product called PowerSense, uh, where we detect when clusters uh, of fiber terminals lose power at the same time. And that likely indicates uh, that there is a lot of power, uh, a loss of power in that area. And so we now provide that information uh, to local power companies and that helps them uh, respond more efficiently. So those are just a few examples of how we will continue to grow revenue. Now, 2022 uh, has been a big year for us because it was the first year uh, of us operating under our building block regulatory regime. Um, and that applies to most of our fiber network. Uh, it's basically the same kind of regime that applies to airports uh, and also to electricity lines businesses. Uh, so the Commerce Commission has recently determined uh, the value of our regulated asset base, the RAB, uh, and they've uh, determined that it was a 5.4 billion starting RAB. Uh, there are two parts to that. Uh, the core RAB, uh, which is basically the fiber assets, and that's valued at about 4 billion. Uh, and then there are financial loss assets of about 1.4 billion. Uh, that recognizes that uh, we had very low revenues uh, during the time that we were rolling out uh, the network. Now, we're allowed to earn a regulated return uh, on that RAB. Now, unfortunately, uh, this rate of return was set pretty much at the height of the COVID economic uncertainty. So our starting whack uh, is only 4.7%. But the good news uh, is that it still fits in our business plan for the next few years. So this will be the rate for the first regulatory period of calendar year 22, 23, and 24. Uh, and given the way the regulatory model works, and also based on uh, the latest market condition in terms of risk-free rate, uh, we should benefit from a materially higher rate uh, for the second period and going forward. So now that we have visibility on regulated revenues uh, for a few years ahead with the regulated model, uh, and now that we're not investing large sums uh, in the fiber rollout, uh, we've been able to implement a new capital management policy under which we aim to pay out 60 to 80 percent of the free cash flow as dividends. Um, we've provided dividend guidance out to FY24. Uh, by reference, we paid 35 cents per share in FY22. But this financial year, we've said that we aim to pay 42.5 cents per share. And then for FY24, we've set a minimum of 47.5 cents. Now, uh, dividends will not be imputed uh, for tax uh, in the short to medium term. Uh, because of the substantial investment that we are making in the fiber rollout over the last decade. So uh, this has resulted in a difference uh, in timing between our tax and our accounting depreciation. So that means that tax payments are effectively deferred to the future and that's why we will not be uh, imputing in the short to medium term. We're also currently about one third done on a $150 million on market share buyback. 
Uh, and just to give you a few financials, in FY22, uh, we generated uh, 675 million in EBITDA uh, out of about 965 million in revenue. So uh, I hope that this has provided you with um, a, a good first view and highlights of what the course business uh, is and the investment opportunity that it represents. Uh, we believe that we offer a great opportunity to invest in what is a growing infrastructure asset, which is fiber, uh, and also in a growing and dynamic sector, uh, telecommunications and IT. And with that, I'm um, happy to take some questions. Thanks, thanks, JB. Appreciate it. Um, do you have a couple questions coming in around the rollout of um, fiber in rural versus urban areas? And what can you talk a little bit about what the, what the cost versus um, revenue? models look like in that and, and if there's any government support to help with those costs or or just kind of how you, you tackle all of that yeah no that's that's a very good question uh, as you would expect uh, clearly the the costs do go up uh, the further out you go into uh, rural areas uh, the ufb program uh, which had uh, three phases ufb1 ufb2 ufb2 plus uh, contributed some government money to assist uh, with that rollout we were also investing our own money uh, in, in the rollout. Um, as I said, we got to 87% coverage. So there is now 13% uh, that is not yet covered by fiber. Uh, it's a wide mix uh, in that 13%. Some of it is just at the edge of what's already been built because you know, there was a boundary defined by uh, the Crown Investment Partners uh, people who were defining where we were rolling out the uh, fiber. So there are streets that are just outside and so Extending the fiber network to those is not very costly, but at the other end, you have properties that are at the end of a you know, 20 kilometer, uh, 20 kilometer dark dirt road and are unlikely to economically ever access to fiber. And so they'll have to get reliable high-speed broadband through other technologies. So it's a, it's a wide mix, that 13% that's remaining. Um, we are clearly indicating that we would like to push that boundary. So we, we've already signaled that with the right regulatory and government support, uh, we think that we can get to 90% uh, of coverage, but we would like to see if the government uh, can actually extend that. Um, as I mentioned in the presentation, in Europe, uh, you've got people targeting 95, 98%. So I don't know whether we'll get that far uh, with New Zealand's geography, but we do believe that there is more room uh, to push out fiber access. Excellent, thank you. And one more quick question here. And then there are some more, we'll, we'll, we'll follow up on, on those uh, out to the group. Talking about like um, ESG is b a big topic now and, and sustainable energy. What measures have you guys put in place to re reduce your carbon footprint? Yeah, a very good question and, and very topical. Uh, the, the biggest one for us, uh, as I mentioned, is uh, to effectively turn off the copper network where we have fiber because as you would expect, those are uh, uh, equipments that consume a lot of energy. And as we have a better network already in place, uh, it's really important. So that's the biggest driver for us to be able to reduce our energy consumption. In parallel, we're looking at, of course, uh, EVs. We're looking at recycling some of the electronics that we have. Uh, E-waste is one of the things that contributes a lot to uh, environmental damage. So that's something that we pay a lot of attention to. Uh, we're looking at uh, solar energy in terms of our exchanges or in terms of our towers uh, and cabinets that are outside in the field. So there's a, a, a suite of initiatives that helps us deliver these carbon emission targets uh, that we have. The biggest one really is making sure that we can turn off the copper network where we have fiber. Yep. Well, JB, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate you putting the slides together and taking the time to join us. We'll get you more questions and get back to everyone. So um, thanks again. I and appreciate next, that. Thank you very much. You bet. Um, so next, I'd like to introduce uh, David Banfield from Comvita. David is the CEO and joined uh, Comvita in January of 2020. He has significant experience leading both private and public sector businesses with revenues up to 300 million. That includes hand, hands-on experience in e-commerce, direct-to-consumer, global retail, and supply chain across multiple continents. So, David, thank you for joining us, and you can take it from here. Uh, tenakoto, tenakoto, tenakoto katsu, uh, no mai harry mai. Um, good morning, everyone, and um, look, delighted to be with you uh, this morning and share a bit about uh, Convita's history, but also uh, the opportunity that we see ahead at, uh, at Convita. I thought I'd start today by just giving you a, a quick overview of Convita at a glance. So we are 
um, the global brand leader in Manuka honey and propolis. We were founded uh, in 1974 in uh, Pairoa in the Bay of Plenty and have been caring for bees since. Right at the start of that journey, we, uh, we had um, a belief that actually we wanted to prove that through science that uh, how efficacious our products were and we founded Cavita Laboratories back in 1974. We have uh, 11 subsidiaries around 350 people around the world in all our major markets out of a total of about 500, just under 560 um, in the group as a whole. We're aiming to get to a 2025 uh, plan which is what we call 60 15 20 where we deliver 60 uh, percent gross margin 15 percent marketing to sales and 20 percent ebitda margin with about 50 percent of our total revenue generated through digital channels either through marketplaces such as amazon alibaba or through our own uh, direct to consumer uh, marketplace or, or our own direct consumer capability that I'll come back to a little bit later. The current total addressable market for Manuka honey or for honey is nine billion dollars uh, with it forecast to grow to 15 billion dollars by 2030 though with Manuka at less than one percent of that uh, of that number. From the start of this particular chapter, one of the things when I when I joined the company, we came back to say um, uh, we just need to be really clear on where we have capability, where we play, and ultimately how we win. So on this screen, you can see the four elements of that that plan. So the first one, the Arotahi, where we put the consumer at the heart of our thinking with the right products, in the right markets, with the right channels, investment in our brand and in science, and our vertical integration then feeding back into the highest quality product. We have a unique business model. We have, as I said, uh, over 350 people on the ground in markets around the world, which we believe fundamentally positions us in a better place to adapt, respond and win with consumers um, who are better connected and makes us a better partner for those consumers in market. From the start, again, we set out our three point plan to stabilize performance, transform the organization and build long-term resilience and growth. We're, we're really pleased with the progress that we're making, though we recognize there's more transformation to come to really set us up for that long-term opportunity. And on the right-hand side, you see stages of organizational development that we broke out sort of crawl stage in that first year into that stride stage in years, uh, years two to three, and then run uh, ongoing. All of that enabling us to build on our proud history as we move towards the exciting future that we see ahead of ourselves. Um, our harmony plan underpins everything that we do, um, and it highlights our determination to leave the world in a better place. Uh, the harmony plan has four distinct elements to it, climate action, bee welfare and advocacy, community impact and native forests and biodiversity. We're delighted with the progress that we're making in all of those areas um, and, and particularly um, you know, we have a, a global issue in terms of bee health, bee welfare and our work to make sure that we put bee welfare at the heart of everything uh, that we do. On the top right hand side you can see our um, carbon footprint calculation. So, so this is our first ever scope one, two, three uh, um, uh, carbon uh, footprint. So you can see our, our gross footprint of 32,500 uh, tons, uh, sequestration benefits from the forest that we plant of just under 6,000 tons, taking us to our net position of just over 26 and a half thousand tons of CO2. We have science-based targets to, uh, to reduce from here. We obviously already know the sequestration benefits that'll be enhanced in 20, FY23, um, but we have a commitment to be carbon neutral FY25 and net positive 2030. 
Um, bottom left, you can see our value creation model, which again captures the essence of, uh, of, of the organization, the inputs that we have and the outputs uh, as a result. And finally there, again, something that we believe sets up and sets our business model aside. You know, in FY22, we planted just over 1.1 million trees. 89% uh, of our product is uh, recyclable. Um, and uh, we had we regenerated just over a thousand hectares of forest and now have about seven and a half thousand hectares of forest which promotes uh, biodiversity and uh, the ability for flora and fauna to thrive. Our ultimate model enables us to have the highest quality with the lowest relative cost with a product that is proven by science, and I'll come back to that a bit later, backed by IP that we invest time and, and money in, um, making us uh, a, a most sustainable brand with a connected team from home to hive. And they also with us having social impact, both here in Aotearoa and around the world, uh, and also reinvesting in forests to again, make sure we bring back the highest quality product to our consumers around the world. On the screen, you can now see our FY22 results. So in FY22, uh, it was the second highest profit um, of all time that the company had delivered record uh, revenue. Our margin up over that gross margin over that 60% mark and significant in our investment in our brand to deliver long-term uh, profitable growth. Earnings per share were 18.2 cents per share, up 34%. Um, our dividends for the full year were at five and a half cents per share, up 37% versus PCP. On the right hand, you can see revenue and contribution from all our market segments around the world. It's really encouraging to see all of the markets uh, in growth in the full year at both revenue uh, and contribution level. Again, proving to us the, the nature of our distinct business model and how longer term that will enable us to win uh, even more. Over the next half a dozen slides, I just want to share with you the compound annual growth rate that we've seen over the last three years, so starting at FY19 in each. So, so first off, um, in Greater China, so you can see the, the revenue three-year CAGA at 5.5% um, and the contribution three-year CAGA at just over 32% over that period. When we look at mainland China, you can see our revenue CAGA has been 15% over the last three years and our net contribution has been plus 47 or 48% over the last three years. We see significant opportunity for growth in North America. Um, it's the world's biggest uh, single Mon uh, monofloral Manuka honey market. Um, you can see our three year revenue CAGA at 33.5% uh, and our three year contribution CAGA at 78 uh, or over 78%. Again, giving us the opportunity to reinvest in the business for long term uh, delivery of the market potential we see there. In terms of gross profit, um, on the right hand side, you can see we've grown our GP from the 37% that we delivered in FY19 to over 60% in FY22. And in absolute terms, from just under uh, 64 million in uh, 2019 to 126 million by uh, 2022. That's been because of the focus that we've had coming back to who we are, where we play, how we win, making sure that we're clear on the products where we have competitive advantage, making sure we, we invest in, um, in manufacturing capability to deliver um, a better overhead recovery, better utilization. And again, all of that uh, focused delivery is coming through now in our margin. Um, alongside that, 
we believe that we have an incredible founding story of Alan and Claude back in the mid 70s, you know, two people coming together with a view that um, uh, that uh, food was the best medicine and that nature had the answers to a lot of the world's problems. The problem that we faced back in 2019 was we had an incredible story, but we didn't have the wherewithal or the means to actually invest in telling that story. With our new model, what we're able to do is because we have a higher margin, we can reinvest more in our brand and tell that incredible story to consumers around the world. On the right hand side, you can also see how our digital share has grown over the last uh, four years from 26% in 2019 to 39% in 2022. That gives us incredible data and that data really feeds into things like product development, but also feeds into us making sure we develop products and services that suit um, changing needs in different periods of time. And finally, there you see our transformation investment included in the results that we've shared. So, you know, in 2021, 1.2 million up to two and a half million, and it will be about five and a half million in this particular year. EBITDA went from a break even in 2019 to uh, reported EBITDA of 30.1 million in 2022. Um, when we normalize out our um, transformation investment, you see that in 2022, our normalized EBITDA percentage would be around 16%, which again is encouraging against our longer term target of 20% uh, EBITDA. So we've recently just uh, um, reconfirmed guidance for the full year that uh, we're forecasting double digit um, earnings growth for the year with a strong weighting to uh, half two. We're assuming sales normalize in China. That means retail opening uh, again um, or offline opening again in um, the second half. We're forecasting profitable top and bottom line growth in our focus growth markets of China and North America channels being digital and categories being uh, Manuka honey. Uh, as I've already said, um, we will be investing about five and a half million dollars in transformation investment through uh, 2023 um, included in our guidance and we're targeting um, a 50 million EBITDA in 2025. Again, I'll come back to that in a couple of minutes, a couple of slides. So here's our uh, 2025 plan. So from the very start of this particular chapter, we shared our business model. We shared the pillars that will underpin our performance out to 2025. So, so as I say, in 22, we delivered 30 million EBITDA. We're targeting 50 million by 2025, 50% of uh, our sales through digital channels. There you see that same model of minimum gross margin of 60%, 15% marketing sales, 20% EBITDA. And then the plans underneath that that will enable us to deliver it. And ultimately the strategic pillars. So Kavita to be recognized, premium, fast moving, consumer goods uh, company, world-class digital engagement and experience with data as a significant competitive advantage for us. Right at the center, science and quality. Then finally, organizational simplification and efficiency for future and becoming sustainable world-class organization. By 2025, we aim to have uh, uh, inventory at around $85 um, million. And one of the crucial elements to us for us is to make sure that we have better alignment between supply and demand over this period. And we're in the process of further simplifying our supply and our supply chain to enable us to deliver this 85 million in 2025. We believe there's an incredibly exciting future ahead for Convita and for the category as a whole. Total addressable market today is around 9 billion US. Uh, it's forecast to grow to 15 billion US by 2031. Current household penetration is less than one and a half percent. We already know we have some markets where household penetration is ahead of 
three percent or three and a half percent so we know what the opportunity potential is for us to deliver um, going forward and equally we know when we're able to deliver products and services that our customers uh, desire um, through our digital channels we're able to grow lifetime value by around 300 percent At the heart of everything is our science and quality program. As I said right at the start, this has been a differentiator for Convita right back to 1974. We have a, a global scientific advisory board who are world leaders in gastrointestinal uh, and digestive health research. We're currently undertaking clinical trials, uh, specifically looking at uh, digestive health. Um, and within that, we have uh, 45 patents granted, further five granted in FY22, um, and an additional 12 patents filed that again, we believe will give us long-term competitive advantage um, in areas that are really exciting for us. The, the shift that we saw in terms of uh, commerce to, to digital channels is here to stay. We launched our proprietary single source platform uh, last year, so from zero to launch in all our markets, in all our major markets last year. Um, as I say, we're targeting 50% of our revenue through e-commerce channels in 2025, uh, driving household penetration, retaining users, and really creating an experience that develops brand fanatics for us. One additional element that we have within our broad portfolio is uh, olive leaf extract. Um, olive leaf is a 15 billion uh, total addressable market on its own, um, but here we have some specific uh, clinical research which proves uh, how olive life or olive leaf can be integral to uh, for heart health support going forward. And uh, again being able to transact through that through our single source platform enables us to correct, collect data and uh, engage with consumers around the world. So um, last, last page for me. So uh, we're on track to deliver our 2025 plan of 50 million EBITDA. We're on track to deliver our 60, 15, 20 business model. We're on track for e-commerce to represent 50% of total sales by 2025. The total addressable market for honey is forecast to grow to 15 billion by 2031. Uh, household penetration is forecast to double. And we know when we transact directly with consumers, we increase that lifetime value. Um, we're pleased with the progress we're making. Our focus on our core category is delivering. Um, the results we shared show that uh, we're building momentum and we believe we have an incredibly exciting future built on talent, uh, science, IP um, and that total addressable market. Uh, thanks thanks very much for your time and uh, I'll take any questions. Thanks David, I appreciate it and uh, you do have a few questions and I guess one of them ties into that last slide a bit in terms of the growth of the, the total addressable market. What is the competitive landscape like and, and how do you guys kind of navigate that and would you look into making acquisitions or how do you kind of bolster your, your positioning there? Uh, look, we operate, we, do, we operate in competitive markets around the world, but, but I think the biggest single thing is that uh, Manuka Honey is a, um, is a unique product and is still pretty widely unknown. So, so um, the, the challenge that we face currently is we can't, because it's a food, we can't really talk about the health benefits, um, which is why we're undertaking that scientific research to really, uh, again, differentiate ourselves, but be able to talk about why we're different um, and the benefit that we uh, that we create. Um, and, and in terms of M&A, um, we're pleased with the progress that we're making um, uh, it's not a focus for us, certainly you know, it's not inherent in our 2025 plans, um, but um, you know, if there were strategic merits, we would, we would consider it. Thank you. Um, there are more, but we'll, we'll, we'll 
get this one last question and then and then send you some follow up. You talked about um, making efforts to simplify or improve your supply chain. How would you go about doing that? Is that a complicated process, or, or are there kind of solutions you're looking at currently? No, there, there's there's a lot of work being done. I think um, historically there's been a disconnect between uh, uh, supply and uh, changing consumer demand. Um, so so we're really working through uh, a a revised model that lets us. Um, uh, lets us just be clear in terms of what the demand signals are and and be more responsive and adaptive to uh, changing needs and that'll that'll create some short-term uh, um, challenges but actually ultimately it's where we have to be as an industry to enable us to thrive going forward well david thank you very much appreciate you taking the time and putting the slides together um, and we'll get, get more questions to you and, and out to the audience. So, so thanks again. Kia ora. Thank you. All right. So our final presenter today, uh, and thanks for the patience, is Nick Lissette, uh, the CEO of Black Pearl Group. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Black Pearl Group is not currently listed on NZX, but they have stated their intentions to list this year. Just a quick background on Nick. Uh, in addition to being the CEO, Nick is also the founder of Black Pearl Group. He has over a decade of experience working with data-driven cloud businesses, including an anti-spam SaaS service called Silver Cloud Mail Company, which was sold in 2012. Uh, after taking the role of Chief Technical Officer at Black Pearl in 2019, Nick has reverted uh, to his role as CEO, where he's overseen a substantial growth in revenue. Uh, so Nick, welcome, and um, over to you. Thank you very much, Doug. Thank you for the introduction. Let me get my slides underway. So what is Black Pearl Group? Well, we're a, a very exciting blend of fast growth uh, SaaS technology and an acquisition platform. So we build and we buy and then we take to market data-driven cloud services. So when I think about like the highlights of our group, our company we were at, we have an amazing team and I think uh, you'd be hard pressed to find a uh, small cap uh, company in New Zealand with a more impressive shareholding register than what we have. Uh, we've had explosive growth. Last year, 244% growth just in organic sales alone. And that has been layered on with our first acquisition. Uh, and we have a great now proven track record and acquisition and playbook that we look forward to expanding on and everything in our technology uh, in our company is underpinned by some um, phenomenal technology. So as you hear me talk about Black Pearl Group today, I'm going to flip between the, the group level, the company level and our, our strategy and the application level and the clients in which they serve. And one thing that you'll note uh, at both company and application level is that we're a business for the times. So I want you to think about the average small to medium sized business out there in the world. Boy oh boy, isn't it a tough environment? I don't need to go over all the economic factors for that, I'm sure everyone's acutely aware of it. But one of the things you might have not known is that uh, the cost of acquiring customers in the digital world has actually significantly increased, uh, which has made it really hard to get more business or, or grow your existing business. So uh, typically in the digital world, you would rely on pay-to-play platforms. That's uh, Facebook, that is Google, or what is it called now, Meta and Alphabet, and, uh, and it's Amazon. But with Apple changing the technology landscape last year, those platforms have had their data supply cut or severely diminished and their algorithms aren't working as well. What does that mean? Advertising is less expensive. You have to pay more money to get the same thing. So that's where Black Pearl come in. We have applied our extensive cloud computing experience to create a private platform. We call it the Pearl Engine for which other companies and applications can sit upon and uh, and the whole purpose of those applications is about transforming 
uh, everyday business tools, which small to medium-sized businesses already have, you transform them into digital marketing tools to help them grow their company. So I've talked a little bit about the great people, so I better back that up. You'll see the ugly mug in the bottom left is myself, and as Doug said earlier, uh, this isn't my third ro uh, first rodeo, it's my third. Um, and uh, as Doug said, my particular cloud experience is, is around email, and that's an important footnote. Now, I know it's a cliche when people say, uh, we wanted to be global from day one. Well, we did want to be global from day one, and we, we backed up the talk. Uh, we invested significant time and energy in, uh, in America, and we're lucky enough because of that to secure as a major investor, as an amazing business partner, and now as our chairman, Tim Crown. Tim is the chairman and founder of Insight Enterprises, which is a Fortune 500 NASDAQ listed technology company. So very fortunate to have such vast experience as our chair and as our partner. Uh, then if you go and look at our shareholding register, well, it's a real who's who of technology luminaries, both locally and internationally. Um, you'll see that we've secured uh, a foundational uh, institutional investor. And if you want to go and look at some of the names that are behind the businesses there, you'll note um, we've got a, the um, just ex chairman of Berkshire Hathaway Automotive on board, um, Sir Owen Glenn, the list goes on. So, very fortunate to have some amazing support. So, let's talk about the market that our application service. And typically, you'd start from the top down. People say, why do I start at application level and go up? Because our applications are what serve our customers, and the customers are the lifeblood of our company. So, our, our, our people, our tribe, are small to medium-sized businesses. Anyone from a solopreneur all the way through to maybe 250 employees, sometimes a little bit bigger than that as well. And our primary focus is in North America. In fact, give or take a percent, uh, about 60% of our customer base is in North America. Now, the the primary area that we have initially focused on, and you'll note that we'll be extending our remit over time, but our initial technologies in the group are focused on business email. Now, business email is the email that you and all the people and the company you work for or the company you own send each and every day to your customers, your potential customers, your vendors, your suppliers, each other, and you'll send that from your computer or your phones, and uh, you know, it'll be sent from Google or Outlook or or or, uh, or maybe Apple Mail, right? That is everyday business email, and that is the area that our first wave of applications sit upon. Why that is so important is because it is a massive, massive market. So by the end of 2025, uh, you'll have uh, 4.5 billion email accounts. So that's half the world's population. And that's growing. So 2020 to 2025, that will be a represented 20% increase. So massive growth market, one that is underappreciated. And because we leverage this huge market, we have broad global appeal, uh, not just with geographies, but also industries with almost every conceivable industry using um, our products. So let's talk about the products in Black Pearl Group. So the first one, which we've built ourselves, is Black Pearl Mail. It's a real product for the times, as I've talked about before, because it's taking everyday email and it's transforming it into a demand generation tool. What does that mean? It means you take a boring email, like the one that you see on the left, hopefully if you're seeing it the same way around as me, it's on the left, and it'll transform it into a stunning brand experience, like the one on the right, which will stand out in a busy inbox, it will really create some cut through to your digital communication. But most critically, what this product does is take that vacant real estate underneath the email signature block and enables you to uh, turn that into a digital billboard. You can put your company's latest products, latest services, referrals, references, whatever helps move the needle from revenue point of view, you start controlling that space. And that therefore kind of offsets those high costs of uh, pay to play marketing by letting you leverage email communication you're already sending. 
Now, underpinning this is some awesome data. And so everything within that email is, um, is actionable and trackable. So you can see when people are clicking on links in your email or the graphics or the digital billboard within your email. You can see when people go back and open emails that you sent them several years ago. So what it does is it takes a blind form of communication, which was email, and it suddenly uh, transforms that. So you've got a real understanding of how people are engaging you, who's ghosting you, who's leaning into you, and you can take that information to make better business decisions. Now we've just completed the acquisition of a leading email signature provider called New Old Stamp. You can see all the amazing brands that they've created signatures for there. Uh, a great acquisition for us because it is a feeder product to move from basic email signatures to like the, the data and analytics which, which underpins Black Pearl Mail. So by itself, New Old Stamp had $1.2 million annual recurring revenue. No small feat, the latest statistics I read said that only 4% of SaaS businesses ever get to a million dollars, so uh, congratulations, they did a great job. Uh, they, had, they got there because they had over a million, or they have over a million organic website visits annually. Again, the amount of money that you have to spend in digital pay-to-pay -pay advertising to get that quality and quantity is immense, so it's a huge asset and they have an amazing team. But the reason why we're always motivated about acquisitions and why that's a big part of our growth strategy is because we're very interested one and one equals three. And that means that the assets of the acquired entity combined with the technical and marketing assets of Black Pearl Group create um, extra organic growth opportunities. Now, why that is the case is because our primary technology is called the Pearl Engine and it is a private uh, private platform, right? So it's a private platform where you've got an array of technology from, you know, obviously bits of code through to specific products and features, data, data processing, a whole stream of things. And that's important because the applications or companies that sit above the platform can access those components, those elements at near zero marginal cost and therefore very quickly benefit from, from that technology. So let's take New Old Stamp as an example. Great basic signature technology, they don't do much with data. So they can lift out those data elements or, or um, access those data elements from the Pearl Engine and suddenly they can increase the average revenue per user, they can help reduce churn, they can enter into new markets. It's going to save millions of dollars of R&D and many years worth of time. So the great thing about our core technology is it saves time and money and creates a multiplier effect for every business that we acquire. Now at the hub of that, we have a strong data element. Uh, data is the fourth uh, fuel of the fourth industrial revolution. And if you don't believe me, ask Facebook, ask Google, ask Amazon, because they had their fuel supply cut by Apple, and now Apple is worth more than all those three companies put together. So it is uh, a big asset that we have created our own fuel, uh, our own source of fuel, and we do that in an ethical way. We don't read the content of emails. We don't store emails for any much past the deliverability, uh, anywhere further past the need for delivering that email. We're just taking uh, hard to access um, bits of data from an everyday server transaction, adding in some other um, proprietary data into it, and then analyzing that to get benefits that we then serve back to our customers. Now it's a self-perpetuating cycle because the better benefits you give back to your customers, the more customers you get, the more data you get, and so the cycle continues. So everything we do at Black Pearl is underpinned by data. Now I'm asked uh, by a lot of people when I tell about our intentions of going public, like what, why would you go public when the, you know, when the economy is how it is at the moment? I'm like, we're going public because the economy is how it is at the moment. There has never been a better time in recent history to buy technology companies. There's never been a better time. Like in America, their access to capital is significantly reduced. If you're in a SaaS technology business, you have to continually invest in your technology to stay relevant. I use the saying internally, grow or die. 
And so we've got a whole series of great technology with the lack of access to capital. They've just come out of hard times with you know all the things that are happening with the global pandemic and now they're facing recession. So what we do is we provide a path to exit and we're not going around just ruthlessly taking these companies over like a bunch of pirates. I know we are called Black Pearl. What we are is a uh, company built by entrepreneurs for entrepreneurs. So we're providing a home for these people to realize the dreams of their product, build towards a meaningful exit and actually fulfill their growth, uh, their growth objectives. So when we think about um, you know, listing, it's a really great way of um, acquiring customers because you can leverage your stock to purchase the businesses. And again, one of the core pillars as to why we're going public. Our acquisition strategy is built on three horizons. Uh, first horizon, which is well underway with purchasing your old stamp is acquiring sort of first generation um, email tracking and branding companies. And then as we move forward, it will be broadening that remit out of email into other digital communication, other SaaS businesses. Basically companies, again, they'll be servicing small to medium sized business, got to be a SaaS model and we're really looking for companies that lack scale or the capital to grow. And I mean, there is a plenty of them in America. Again, such a wonderful time to acquire um, other technologies. We're acquiring these technologies and I'll say it again, we're actually doing acquisitions for organic growth. I know that sounds weird, but we don't want to just buy revenue. We don't just want to buy talent. We don't just want to buy market share. What we want to do is take unrealized assets and out of the companies we are acquiring and actually unlock the latent value in that. So again, to use new old stamp as an example, there is a whole lot of synergies right off the bat. So we eliminate the waste with the Black Pill Mail product leads, 50% leads coming to that product weren't compatible with it, but they're immediately compatible with New Old Stamp. If you then go and look at New Old Stamp, they've got a million organic site visits. They paid zero paid marketing dollars to uh, retarget them. So if you look at any of uh, the literature out there about the effectiveness of retargeting, statistically the average is 150% increase in conversion. So there's a natural uplift in conversion through applying our marketing budget to their organic leads. And then most importantly, we're taking a commodity item, which is email signatures, and then giving the opportunity of upselling that to a meaningful demand generation tool underpinned by analytics. That is a unique market segment. And by doing that, increasing the average revenue per customer on average by 6,000, uh, lifetime revenue per customer by $6,000. So, uh, as Doug said, we have the intention of listing onto NZX and we're aiming for the first week of December. By the time we hit, uh, by the time we get there, um, we should have an implied market cap around 50 mil. Uh, our share price will be $1.24, is $1.25 per share. We have reserved the ticker BPG. We'll be hitting the about at the end of this month, which is uh, only a few days away, we're at $2.8 million in annual recurring revenue. Um, and again, we had explosive organic growth last year and we've just layered on, of course, a uh, new old stamp with $1.2 million, um, which will really add to that trajectory for, um, for the coming year and moving forward. So um, very exciting times. That is the story of Black Pearl. It's high growth SaaS, it's data, it's acquisitions, it's all the fun <clears> stuff. Over to you for some questions, Doug. Excellent. Thank you, Nick. Um, appreciate the time and the slides. Do have a bunch of questions. The first <laughs> one is, uh, how does Pearl Engine link in with other cloud-based systems? Do you, do you seek to market it as a standalone cloud and migrate customers over? Does it does it work with other systems that are out there? Yeah, great question. No, it's a private platform. So essentially only companies that we end up buying either part, you know, partly or an entirety or technologies we own access it. So we're not trying to create sort of like an ecosystem or anything like that. All we think of like the Pearl Engine is like 
like a library or a smorgasbord of very robust proven technology that new application just pull things right out, plug it in, and then immediately access new market segments. So why that's, I guess, important again is because of the organic growth that creates, but it's also really exciting if you're an entrepreneur and you're kind of hitting a brick wall and don't have anywhere near to go. You know, you feel very passionate about your company and your product, um, but you don't act, lack, you know, have the capital and you're running out of steam. So it's a win-win really joining, you know, being acquired by Black Pearl. Another question, you talked about your acquisition strategy, phase three, um, or phase three was your acquisition strategy. Is social media some businesses something that you would look to acquire? And this is saying specifically the news surrounding Twitter and what sort of free float adjustments are you leaving, I guess, headroom or, or space uh, to make acquisitions and expansions uh, into those areas? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. And uh, wow, I, I can't believe you're trying to lump me in with Elon Musk. I, whoever asked that, I'm uh, yeah, I'm hugely appreciative of you joining the two together. I always thought of him like a brother. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, that that is certainly um, probably a third horizon for us. So when we think about the technologies on what we're looking for. The reason why I was sticking with email, other than the fact it's a huge market off the bat, is because it's de-risked. You know, you understand the code base, you understand the market, you know, like the back of their hand. I mean, I've been in it for a long time, so is our extended team. When we move past that, it's really looking for other digital communication tools, I guess, you know, um, things that work in with Slack, um, with Teams and that ilk. Um, are really advantageous or stuff that can help um, leverage your website more effectively. So I think that's the next stream. And and then, you know, uh, what we do with Twitter in, in phase three, well, uh, I don't want to comment on that. Last question, then we'll, we'll, we'll run, run out of time. We'll get you more. Regarding the acquisition strategy, will you guys have a geographic focus or will you be looking throughout the US or Australia, New Zealand or kind of every, anywhere you, you can find opportunity? Yeah, we have a very uh, broad remit there. So um, whilst the company that we just purchased was, you know, a registered US company, I think there's some very exciting buying opportunities out of Europe at the moment. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, we are now got, um, a, 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 you know, we've got staff in Europe and the US and New Zealand, uh, uh, you know, in North America. So we're already We've got you know that that global web of staff and team members in place so it really means it's you know just where the best businesses rather than specific um geographic locations nice well nick thank you very much uh, we'll we'll shut it down here send you some more questions i uh, appreciate the time and uh effort in putting the slides together anyone out there that has questions for any of the presenters about any of the companies just get in touch with us and we'll get you the information but uh, thank you very much, and thanks, everyone, for joining. Bye-bye. Thanks, Doug.